Morning. Would Labour boost the country's budget? President Biden is on his way. And of course, we'll talk about the BBC. It's a packed 60 minutes. Stick with us. It's barriers. Not just not just economic Climate protests on his own platform when Keir Starmer was talking about education and the economy. We do have to fix the fundamentals. We can't carry on just patching up. And protests on the picket line too as the fight over teachers' pay goes on. There are no decisions that are easy when it comes to bringing inflation down, but we have to do the things that are right for the long-term benefit of the country. Protest at the most genteel location, climate activists at Centre Court. But the biggest shouts right now are about the serious squeeze on the economy. Rate hikes, pricier government borrowing and the fastest fall in house prices in years. There is plenty of protest at the government's plans. But our main question this morning, what would Labour do instead? The woman who can tell us is Rachel Reeves, who wants to be Labour's next Chancellor. How does the government explain what's gone wrong? Treasury Minister Victoria Atkins joins us too. How much trouble is the BBC in with a star presenter under fire? President Biden will be touching down here in a few hours' time. His climate envoy and friend, John Kerry, is here first. And you know us, it is Sunday, so there will be some stardust. James Norton of Happy Valley and Luke Thompson of Bridgerton on their very different stage partnership, shortly to be on our cinema screens. Morning, morning with all of us at the desk for the next hour. David Gawke, who sat in Conservative cabinets for many years. The editor of The Daily Mirror, Alison Phillips, and the former editor of ITN, professor and TV newsman, Stuart Parvis. A very warm welcome to you all. Now, before we come to our panel, let's have a look at what's on the front pages, of course. We'll start with that. And no surprise, this morning, most of them are leading on the story about the BBC. We'll actually hope to look at them in just a few seconds. They're not displaying for now. So let's hear the very latest with the BBC's entertainment correspondent. Oh, there are the newspapers, after all. Goodness me, they were slow, but there they are. And they pretty much all lead on the BBC story. The front of the mail says the BBC is in crisis over a top star sex photos probe. The Sun appears to have more salacious detail. They broke the story first yesterday. And the Mirror says the BBC star partied with bosses after the complaint was made. The broadsheets also go with this story. The Sunday Times again says there is a BBC crisis. And the Sunday Telegraph says the BBC is now under fire over an explicit picture scandal. Let's now speak to Lizo Mazimba, the BBC's entertainment correspondent. What do we actually know this morning, Lizo? Well, these very serious allegations came out in the Sun newspaper over the weekend about someone the newspaper describes as a top BBC star. The newspaper says the well-known name paid more than £35,000 to a young individual in return for that individual sending sexually explicit photographs of themselves, something the newspaper says began when the individual was 17 years old and legally still a child. Uh, the presenter in question, we understand, isn't due on air in the near future, uh, but we're not sure and we haven't been able to confirm whether the BBC has formally suspended that presenter or not. Uh, the BBC, of course, has some very serious questions to ask in this uh, answer in this matter. The individual, the young individual's family say through the sun that they complained to the BBC back in May, but that the presenter remained on air. Uh, the BBC has said that it takes any allegations very seriously and that it attempts to speak to those who've contacted them to get further details. But uh, the BBC pointed out if it gets no reply or receives no further contact, that can limit its ability to progress things, but that doesn't mean inquiries stop. So all of this, of course, has the potential and in all probability is already doing serious damage to the corporation's reputation. Lizo, thanks very much indeed. I mean, Alison, you and 
other newspaper editors have put this story very prominently. It's clearly very serious for those directly involved. But why do you think it matters to the wider country? Um, I think the BBC is a national public broadcaster. The whole relationship between the BBC and the viewers is based on trust. And if what we're seeing here is a breakdown of trust, both between the presenter and this individual, but also between the presenter and their bosses, and also between that whole relationship between viewer and, and, the, and the broadcaster, that has huge implications. And I think news, news is entirely built on trust. If you don't believe the people who are bringing you the news, that's where so much breaks down, that's where you get the breakdown in democracy. We are, though, being very clear. We're not speculating at all about this identity of the person involved here. The BBC is a huge organisation that does all sorts of different things. But, Stuart, this is your world. You're, I think, still on the board of Channel 4. You've advised lots of different broadcasters after a long career at ITN. What do you think the risks are here for the BBC more broadly? Uh, I've just finished my stint on the Channel 4 board. But ah. Indeed, I was there for seven years, so that sounds fair. Well, I think uh, there are two issues which arise out of what Alison said about how does trust uh, apply here. Two, one is, can you trust the BBC to follow up on allegations? Mm -hmm. So you've got The Sun this morning on the inside page. Here are the eight questions that we asked the BBC and they wouldn't answer any of them. And some of them are quite basic questions. And then you've got the political angle, which is, can you expect the BBC to be honest with people about what they find? And, I mean, I, we don't know where this person works in news or somewhere else, so, so we, we can't be assuming that they, I, I, they work in news. But we have to say that the BBC has worked incredibly hard in recent times on trying to reinforce it, its position as the, the nation's broadcaster of trust. This does not help. And if you were in the BBC right now, what would you be doing? How would you be trying to manage what the newspapers all say is a crisis and many people would agree it is already? Well, I think, first of all, you have to gather around you people who know what they're doing and people you trust yourselves. You need human resources, you need lawyers, you need communications people, you need the people, the bosses of the person who's under scrutiny. Uh, and for, you've got to remember that every single email you send each other is going to be the subject to review and is going to be public at some point. So the pressure on the, the top of the BBC at this, at this moment is enormous. First of all, to respond on the day, but also to be aware of the long-term issues that will come. And we're going to talk about that more later, but David, we're about to talk to Rachel Reeves. You were a Treasury Minister at a very difficult time after the credit crunch. Quickly, is what they're facing now in the Treasury and in the Labour Party worse or easier than what you had to deal with? It's pretty difficult, let's put it that way. Um, whoever is going to be in power after the next general election is going to face uh, real pressures on public spending. Uh, it's going to face uh, borrowing levels which are uncomfortably high. Uh, we've got tax rates higher than we've uh, had for 70 years. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of combination of, of, of factors that is going to be really, really tough. And a sort of sense that we're not delivering economic growth. So pretty so, grisly, pretty grisly. Questions. Well, we'll talk about both of those issues in more detail later on in the show. We know through your emails and messages, you tell us every week how hard things are just when it comes to making ends meet. For many months, polls suggest the public doesn't have that much faith in how the government is handling the economy. But what would Labour really do differently, given it shares the desire not to let the nation's debt get out of hand? Well, Rachel Reeves is the woman who wants to knock on the door of number 11 and walk through it at the next general election. She's the Shadow Chancellor. Great to have you with us, at all, as always. Um, first of all, on this issue of the BBC, what should the BBC do this morning? Well, I do feel that I often come on this programme and we always start with another crisis at the BBC. And the BBC do need to speed up their processes. It looks like that these issues were raised in May mm. and we're now in July and the presenter stayed on air. That's not good enough. So the BBC need to get their house in order and give greater clarity to now to what on earth has gone on in this case and what they're doing to try and put it right. OK, well, let's talk about the job that you want to do. Um, this morning you are talking about housing. If you become Chancellor, will you spend taxpayers' money on building houses? This isn't about spending taxpayers' money. This is about unblocking the planning system. It's about uh, um, offering some form of uh, guarantor for uh, people who are struggling to save a deposit but can afford the monthly mortgage repayments. 
this government have blown it when it comes to home ownership. Home ownership is now falling under a Conservative government and it is clear that it is only Labour now that can help people fulfil their dreams of owning their homes but, because it's only Labour that will get builders building again in a way that we need to build those homes for people. But there are 1.2 million people on social housing waiting lists right now. Now, if you're not going to spend taxpayers' money on getting houses built, how are the things you're talking about really going to make a difference to that? Well, if you look at home ownership levels, they were once as high under the last Labour government as, as 70%, 70% of people owning their own homes. That's fallen now to 64%. And indeed, but that's not my question. People... My question is, if you're not going to spend taxpayers' money building houses, you've been really clear about that, how on earth can you guarantee to our viewers that there are going to be more homes to rent and more homes to buy? Well, because builders want to build, it's just the planning system uh, mitigates against that. The government, of course, got rid of the planning uh, targets, so local authorities now have no obligation, no targets to build uh, new homes. And as a result, those homes aren't getting built. And this has a real economic impact as well. If house building falls in the way that is now expected, that's a £44 billion hit to the UK economy every single year. And many businesses as well say that they struggle uh, to recruit people because people can't afford to live in the places where the jobs are being generated. But, but success so this is incredibly important. Everybody knows it's important. This so that builders can build. And everybody knows it's important, but successive Conservative governments have said, ah, we'll unplock the planning system. That's what we need but, but to do. That's exactly the formula. Opposite, Except that many experts in this sector think unless you're going to do something much bolder much bigger something like perhaps spending taxpayers money to get things built it's not going to make that and much that's not difference. what the house builders are saying the house builders are not saying that they need government money what they are saying is they want those planning targets uh, back and they want the planning system uh, unblocked that is what labor offers in contrast to the conservatives but do you really think can you really tell our viewers that there's very much difference to what you're saying because the conservatives say oh we're going to work around a planning well, system you're saying you're no, going to no, work around Lord, the planning system. The government are not saying that. The government, Rishi Sunak, caved into his back benches a few months ago um, at Christmas last year, three days, um, I think, before Christmas, caved in and said, do you know what, we'll just, we'll just end these planning targets. Mm -hmm. So they are not even trying. They've given up, they've blown it. But you're we confident that tinkering the with the planning system. system is going to make a big difference to putting roofs over Absolutely. people's heads in this country. And, and that is what builders are saying to us as well. You unblock the system and we will build the homes and then young people and families who dream of home ownership will be able to fulfill that dream again and, and let me just also say this you know there are people who have managed to get on the housing ladder mm -hmm. who are now seeing their dreams turn into nightmares because of the Tory mortgage bombshell but you're not proposing giving them money to help are you well what we've said is that the uh, scheme for lenders has got to be mandatory at the moment people are falling through the cracks because their lenders aren't signing up but you're schemes. not proposing to give them taxpayers cash which no, is no one li is, li no, but, well, the Liberal make, Democrats are but we've, well, we've got lot, fine, we've got lots well, to talk that about. that makes so. no sense at all to be honest because we are in a high inflation environment um, uh, just an untargeted uh, giveaway to people makes no sense at all. This is about practical things to keep people who are struggling in their homes okay. and that's what Labour's scheme would do. Let's talk about one of the other big areas that I know you really care about. Um, last time you came on this programme you said that you'd be spending £28 billion a year on green projects. You said it was crucial and you said it needed urgency. Now since you came on last that has now been delayed. Are you 100% committed to reaching that level of spending, £28 billion a year, by the end of the first parliament if you win the election? I can't overstate the damage the Conservatives have done to the economy, but I'm not going to apologise for making sure that our sums add up. And since I first announced Labour's green prosperity plans, interest rates have gone up 13 times. Inflation's now at 8.7%, seems to be stuck there, been there for the last two months. And I've always been clear that all our policies, including investing in the industries of the future and boosting our energy security, are subject to our fiscal rules, which means paying for day-to-day -day spending through tax receipts and getting debt down as a share So that of our explains economy. the delay, but my question is, are you committed to spending that £28 billion by the end of your first Parliament if you win the election? We're confident that we can get there, but all of our but plans are you committed will always to it? be... Yeah, 
we're committed to it, but it's subject to our fiscal rules. And that's really, really important to say that. And those are your limits on spending, that jargon. <laughs> yes, and what I say is that you pay for day-to-day -day spending through tax receipts and you get debt down as a share of the economy. You know, David Gork made a really good point on the panel earlier. You know, debt has tripled under the Conservatives. Debt is now the same size as our whole economy. We've got to get a grip of that and all of our plans will be consistent with those fiscal rules. And those fiscal rules which are the spending limit so that you only borrow if it's something for a big long-term project and everything else is accounted for day to day. That is very clearly from what you've just said at the absolute top of your list. All of and our plans, other things will have to wait. All of our plans will be built on a rock of economic and fiscal responsibility. Labour will not play fast and loose with the public finances because the people who pay the price for that are people who are own their own homes, who wish to own their own homes, people running small businesses who have been terribly affected by the turbulence in the economy, the increases in mortgage uh, rates, the increases in prices in the shops. We will never put family finances at risk but in the way the Conservatives have. But that does mean have. by implication that your £28 billion target, which I know you care about very deeply, that could still be vulnerable, that could be ditched if the numbers well, don't I, work. If we look at the numbers in the most recent government forecasts, uh, we can get to that total investment of £28 billion a year. The government, of course, are spending but you're money not themselves. Committing to it. Uh, well, everything will be subject to the fiscal rules, okay, but the numbers that we that really see clear. currently, yeah. the numbers we see currently, I'm confident that we can get there. But the fiscal rules are non negotiable. I will never play fast and loose with the public finances. What's interesting about this is that the last time we had a government um, that said fiscal rules, spending limits were at the top of the list, the way they dealt with that was to introduce austerity. And by your analysis, you've written, austerity starved the economy of the investment it needs to grow. Austerity failed. But listening to you today, if spending limits those fiscal rules at the top of your list, by your logic, you might make the same mistake again. No, that, that this is nothing like um, what the Conservatives uh, did. It's why, for example, the um, borrowing to invest is different from borrowing to pay for day-to-day -day, uh, spending. Investing in assets that can grow our economy it is essential if we want to break out of this doom loop of low growth, high taxes... But you've just and said you'll only do that uh, if you can afford to. Well, and, yeah. what, and, and isn't it the case... And you're very proud, I think, of being disciplined on this. But isn't it the case that that discipline means going into the next election, it's very likely that Labour and the Conservatives will basically be following the same kind of tram lines on spending? I don't accept that at all. If you look, for example, what we've said around taxation of non-DOMs, I believe if you make your home in Britain, you should pay your taxes here. You know and that's a Labour, marginal we'll, we'll, issue. Well, it may be important well, to some people, no, Laura, but you know think, that's a small well, amount of well, cash Laura, in the overall thing. I don't I think £3.5 billion a year is marginal and we've said that we would use that money to invest in one of the biggest ever workforce expansions in the NHS. You had Steve Barclay on this programme last week. He said that he had an NHS workforce plan but he had no idea how it was going to be funded. Labour do, we would fund it through that non-DOM tax status uh, being um, revoked. That is a tax loophole that has existed for 200 years. Labour would close it to invest in our public services. That's the difference between Labour and Conservatives. I explain how our sums add up and I close loopholes if they don't work for working people and use them for the priorities that we see, the priorities for this country. And just yes or no, are you disputing then a suggestion, a report in the Sunday Times this morning that basically your spending plans are on the same track as Conservatives? You dispute that? Well, they're not on the same track. I've just given you one example, but there are okay. others as well. But I am absolutely committed to fiscal discipline and I have no desire to see the tax burden on working people increase. In fact, I would like the tax burden on working people to be lower. But it all has to be built on that rock of economic and fiscal stability. Because if you put that at peril, then you see what's happened in our economy these last few months with sky-high interest rates and inflation that is very difficult to get under control. The election may still be a long time away, a lifetime in political sense, but Labour has been in the polls way ahead for many, many months. Um, and it's interesting, some recent surveys have suggested that you're starting to get the kind of recognition as somebody who uh, is very likely to be the next chancellor. You've built your, your argument this morning on being very tough on spending, very strict, but do you think you'll be a radical chancellor? Is that what you would want to be? 
I, I want to be the Chancellor that grows the economy and gives this country its hope and its future back. I, I go around the country and I see huge potential. You know, businesses with great ideas, universities with fantastic young people with uh, ideas to start new businesses and grow their businesses, families and young people who are excited about the future. But what we don't have today is a government that matches that scale of ambition. It's why the plans we've set out, including the Green Prosperity Plan, to invest in carbon capture and storage, mm -hmm. GB Energy, a wholly publicly owned energy company to invest in energy generation, our modern industrial strategy, our plans to make Britain the best place to start and grow a business. This can transform the UK economy building the security that we need for family finances is anti-inflationary, can help get bills down and can bring to Britain the jobs of the future. You've got John Kerry on the programme in, later. In a couple of minutes, which and, is why we must wind and, up this in, interview. But in I, the I, US, I, they are seizing these opportunities to grow the economy. And I, just I don't want, want to ask other you countries what? stealing a march on Britain. We've got the idea and the talent here. We've got to harness it. And quickly, not everybody might know this, but you were a champion chess player as a child. Um, politics is sometimes talked about as a chess game. Um, so if it is, where do you think you've got the Conservatives? Are you yet checkmate yet? Well, I'd describe it as we're um, a, a rook ahead after about 30 moves, but we're playing an opponent that usually beats us. So this is not in the bag, uh, but we are determined to to offer to the country the hope that it needs, but also the reassurance that our sums uh, add up and we can make the change that this country desperately needs. OK, a rook ahead. I'm going to have to go off and look up, look up what that actually means. But Rachel Reeves, so that's five points. OK, thank you very much indeed, Rachel Reeves. It's always great to have you here with us in the studio. What did you think? You can let us know, of course, as ever. Email us at koonsberg at bbc.co.uk or on the social media. If you're that way inclined, you can use the hashtag BBC Laura K and we'll try and share some of the conversation later in the show. And you can go to the BBC Live page. The address is there for you, bbc.co.uk, if you want to follow as we go along. Now, if Labour wanted evidence to back up its focus on climate, there is plenty of that around, as we've just been hearing. Last week, the temperature right around the world broke records. And the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, said this. The situation we are witnessing now is the demonstration that climate change is out of control. Out of control, according to the United Nations. Well, Secretary Kerry is with us this morning. Warm welcome to the studio. It's your job as climate envoy to persuade people they have to do more, but the numbers suggest it's not working. Well, I disagree with that. I think that all around the world, people are captivated by the crisis and, and deeply, deeply concerned about it. You just had a 66-year-old gentleman going out in the middle of the Wimbledon court and demonstrating and willing to be arrested. There is civil disobedience building in communities around the world. And I think if you listen to the scientists, which not enough people are, mm. the last week they have described as terrifying and as uncharted territory. When you see the risks of what is happening already with global ice melt, with challenges of fires, of uh, mudslides, of the heat, people dying from the level of heat, the quality of air, people are dying around the world, in the millions, by the way, about 8 million people a year die from that. And, and it comes from one thing. This is not complicated. It is the way we have chosen to propel our vehicles, heat our homes, light our factories and businesses. It's, it's the provision of power, burning fossil fuel without capturing the emissions. We have two choices. You either capture the emissions or you don't create them in the first place. And that's the challenge that we face now. If you think, though, of what's happening in countries like China, where coal mine production is still going up, countries like India, countries who maybe sometimes talked a good game at big international gatherings like COP, the numbers in many cases are still going the wrong way. So why are. are you failing to persuade they people to take a kind of well, radical action? <laughs> persuading people. China, Leaders. China is a country, a huge country. It's the largest emitter in the world. And we need China to cooperate, and we need to cooperate with China. People are sort of in this standoff, but we can't afford to be, which is why President Biden has just had the Treasury Secretary in China talking about economics, but who also talked about climate. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there will be other visits. And what we're trying to do is, is change the dynamic between our nations. We are the two largest economies in the world. Mm -hmm. We are the two largest emitters 
of greenhouse gas emissions. We need to work together in a cooperative way. I believe the Chinese are now talking about and thinking about how we can do that. We, we need to figure out that. But President Biden is, is, is uh, deeply committed to, to this endeavor. Tomorrow, we are hosting, uh, we, Grant Chaps, the Secretary of, of uh, Energy Security and Net Zero, and I are hosting a morning event with a group of philanthropists and CEOs. And we've been very graciously invited to brief President uh, Biden and His Majesty King Charles afterwards about how we can accelerate the deployment of literally trillions of dollars, because it's investment mm. by the private sector that ultimately is going to accelerate this transition. What about the UK then? I know you take a close interest, and we've talked to you on the program before about the King's interest in climate change, but the UK until quite recently used to boast it was a leader on climate change. And yet recently its own sort of independent adjudicator, the Committee on Climate Change said actually now the UK was missing targets. I mean, are you disappointed that the UK seems to have softened some of its eagerness to be at the forefront? I think we have a challenge globally, including in the United States, to get people to move faster. And we are doing, President Biden's trying everything possible, including the Inflation Reduction Act, which mm -hmm. has raised some hackles in Europe and various places. But what we're doing is trying to excite, to incentivize the private sector to move faster, but, and that's happening. But will you tell the UK to move faster? Because well, we're, it, not gonna, we're not gonna sit there and tell people things. I think that's a kind of diplomacy that doesn't work. I think President Biden uh, looks forward to having conversations. I know he's gonna be meeting with the prime minister, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure, uh, Climate will be a critical component of that conversation because it has to be. If we don't do this, the disruption to all investment, the disruption to supply chains, the movement in migration of tens of millions of people, if you have food production imploding in Africa, for instance, or the heat that we're now seeing in various parts of the world, people can't work outdoors in that kind of heat. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing already in every aspect of life, it is now being affected by the climate crisis. But again, I say, this is not something where everybody has to go, oh my God, I don't want to do this because it's scary as hell and because we're not gonna uh, you know, live the way we did. No, we will have a better quality of life. Mm -hmm. If you clean up the air, there'll be less people getting cancer, less people with emphysema or heart disease being affected. You'll have uh, incredible health benefits. Mm -hmm. You will have food production and security benefits. You will have, uh, obviously, the quality of air and climate. Mm -hmm. but, but equally importantly, our economies will flourish. Mm -hmm. We're seeing unbelievable growth in jobs, unbelievable movement in, in, in the job market, moving towards these new uh, jobs. That, the, the fastest growing job in America a few years ago was, was wind turbine technician, mm -hmm. third fastest solar panel distributor. So there is a lot moving. Um, one area though where we've all seen the importance of energy and energy prices of course is what's been happening in Ukraine and this week President Biden announced that the US would send cluster bombs to Ukraine to help them in that conflict. Now as a former Secretary of State you'd express concern about the impact that those weapons can have on civilians and indiscriminate killing of women and children. Aren't you worried about their use in this conflict? Well, I think everybody's always going to be worried about how something is used. And, and I know the president uh, has described this as a very difficult decision, and he's putting constraints on how that can be used. But that's not my bailiwick right now. I'm, I'm trying to build consensus around climate, and I'm not getting involved in the various foreign policy and political issues of the day, sometimes as frustrating as that might be. Uh, Do you but, wish you could say something on it? Uh, no, I'm, 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 uh, I'm very comfortable focusing on something that is as threatening and as large a security threat. We just came, I just came from Vienna, where I spoke at the OSCE, the, the European uh, security group, 57 mm -hmm. countries. And there's a genuine focus on climate as a security issue in every respect, health, food, economies, uh, national security. And, it, and it really touches everything across it all touches of those everything. issues. Secretary yes. Kerry, it's a privilege to have you here in My the studio. It'll be here. interesting to see what happens when President Biden arrives in a few hours' time. Thank you to you for fitting you. us in before that visit. You can, of course, follow the President's visit to the UK across the BBC. But let's go back to our panel and find out what they made of all of that. That's been a busy 20 minutes or so. Um, 
David, firstly to you. So Rachel there was making the case that Labour will be different, but some of the things she said about fiscal discipline, I have to say, do remind me of the kinds of things that you and your colleagues in the Treasury used to say, you know, 10 years ago. I'm sure she wouldn't thank me for saying that, but that kind of pride that she has in talking about discipline. Yeah, very true. And there, and there is a bit of a contradiction there. There's no, there's no getting away from it. Um, I, I mean, I think she is right, both in terms of policy terms and the politics, to send a clear signal that a, a Labour government with her as Chancellor would be cautious on public spending. The Conservatives always want to attack Labour for being profligate, for being prepared to run up more borrowing. Uh, and so she's trying to address that vulnerability and she's made huge progress politically in doing that. But you're still left with the question, well, how are things going to be different and how are they going to get the economy to grow? She's playing, placing a lot of weight on planning reform. Mm -hmm. And I think my former colleagues in the Conservatives have given them an opportunity there because mm -hmm. they've dropped the national targets. Um, but there's not that much else coming from Labour explaining why things are going to be much and better. And Alison, for mirror readers who you know tend to be Labour voters, not always, but they tend to be on mm. the left, do you think they'll have heard things there that will excite them, make them want to go to the ballot box? Um, I think what they've seen from Rachel <coughs> is a very sensible woman who's going to be in charge of the finances. And there's an awful lot to be said for that. I mean, you know, Rachel Reeves isn't going to lend you a fiver if she thinks that, that might have an impact on the working person's tax burden. So everyone knows where they stand. And that is kind of an important plank to get down there. But then I think at the end she came to the point about hope and that's where excitement comes, excitement mm -hmm. and hope. And quite often excitement and hope come with a price tag. So even, the, even the, when you were trying to push her on uh, the green commitments, will we see them towards the end of Parliament? Mm -hmm. there's, there's a big price tag on those. Mm -hmm. And I think what you've just got to hope, they've, the, the Labour have got to hope, is that people are going to be patient for a couple of years mm -hmm. when they get things back in order and then we start to see the fruits of the hope and the excitement. But it's interesting, doesn't it? It casts a sort of certain canvas for the next election and of course, look, everything could change. But it doesn't look like, like we're going to be in some kind of traditional fight where one party is saying, we'll spend all of this on this and milk and honey will flow out yeah. of the taps and the other party is saying, oh no, that's terrible, they'll waste it all. It might be quite... a sort of constrained affair. I think both sides quite defensive, mm -hmm. um, partly because that's where the sort of economic conditions are, that's mm -hmm. the situation. Uh, and although you can make a comparison with 1997, where of course mm. Tony Blair and Gordon Brown said we're going to stick to the Conservative spending plans, again provided a lot of reassurance, you know essentially the economy was strong mm -hmm. and the public finances were in a very sound footing. Except, it's not going to be the case this time. Except that there are economists on the left and politicians on the left of the Labour Party and people also on the economists on the right and on the right of the Conservative Party would say actually all this centrist stuff in the middle where everyone says let's be careful, that's not going to match the scale of the challenge at all. Yeah, well I think the centrist answer might be you know, one of the impediments that the UK economy has is mm -hmm. that it's much harder to trade with our biggest market than was the case until very recently. Mm -hmm. And if Labour really want to have a compelling economic narrative, they could be bolder on Brexit than they have been up till now. And we know that they don't want to talk about that at all. We've just had three or four years of people being promised milk and honey, all sorts of nonsense from people in charge, and people just want someone they can trust. Interesting also the conversation about climate and John Kerry talking about civil disobedience. I want to uh, show our viewers a very sort of uh, refined form of civil disobedience. It was somebody at the wedding of the former Chancellor George Osborne yesterday throwing orange confetti over him and his new wife. Um, David, do you think the Conservatives are now missing a trick on climate by appearing less committed than they were under Boris Johnson? I think there has been a bit of a shift there, um, and not necessarily in a, in, in a good way either. I do think on things like onshore wind, mm -hmm. for example, that should be a very easy win. It's actually a popular policy to allow onshore wind turbines, um, and yet the government is not embracing that. It's I not think always very popular with Tory, Tory members. No, I know, yeah. but I think they're on the wrong side uh, of the argument there and they should shift their got, position. Got to ask if you were invited to the wedding. It looked like the sort of political event of the year. Well, I, I sadly not, <laughs> but, um, but quite a lot going on. I didn't mean to on. intrude on any, any uh, uh, on. Uh, private yeah. um, Stuart, let's talk then about the BBC. Now, Rachel Reeves said, you know, basically, get on with it. Why is it taking so long? That is the basic question. So we know that the parent of the teenager contacted the BBC, she says, in May, May the 19th. Mm -hmm. Now, the son says this morning that the BBC investigator met 
uh, this parent on Friday evening, and documents were handed over. That is, an, if that is the first, if that is true, and if that is the first occasion, that's a very long time to have sat down. Because if you think about it in the detail, if this money was being transferred from this presenter's bank account to this young person, as is being suggested, you go straight to the bank account, don't you? I mean, that should not take too long. So you, we want to know what was the BBC's appetite for getting to the truth, and what were the specifics for getting to the truth. And we will, no doubt, have political debate building around this and some MPs have been on social media uh, giving their views. Priti Patel, the prominent Conservative and form, ho former Home Secretary, said the BBC response has been derisory. Um, the BBC has become a faceless and unaccountable organisation. The former Culture Secretary Nadine Dorries has said that there should be no place to hide for broadcasters who attempt to cover up this sort of behaviour. And Caroline Dynich, who is now the chair of the uh, Culture Committee in Parliament, she's given a statement and said it's vital the TV companies have in place the right system. There's pressure on the BBC now to answer some questions. Um, Stuart, in the sort of, I suppose, the, the panoply of crises, I mean, as Rachel said, she quite often gets asked questions about the BBC in crisis. Yeah. At this early stage, do you have a sense of how messy this could get? Well, personally, I think the, uh, the criticisms you raised there were unjustified at this point, mm -hmm. because actually the BBC has not explained itself. Well, the question is, why hasn't the BBC explained itself? One, because it's worried about the legal issues of, of any kind of detail which might point to identity or, or, or any other potential offence, uh, and it's trying to get through the process. The problem is, it looks evasive. It mm -hmm. doesn't look, in the, in the jargon of the hour, transparent. Mm -hmm. So and the statement they issued yesterday, to me, was mm -hmm. almost pointing to the purse to the parent as the problem it was sort of implying that this the parent had not actually told them what they needed to know and the answer was well how how quickly did you respond now i cast your mind back to 2012 the jimmy savile affair 2016 the james ja uh, dame janet smith review mm -hmm. listed five failings and said the bbc nest improve on when these kind of allegations are made I'd be intrigued to know when all this has died down, whether the BBC has followed the things it said it would do back in 2016. Alison, briefly. Well, I think when, you've, when, when a complaint like this comes in, the first starting point is this, this has got to be dealt with immediately and this is going to become public at some point. So what are we going to do get on the front foot of it? The idea that, you know, oh, we tried to engage with the family and we didn't hear anymore is really poor. You've got, to be, you've got to be every single moment of every single day you are trying to create a case to find out what's going on. And that's where I think the BBC has let itself down. OK, well, we should emphasise there's a limit to what we know at the moment and, of course, there are legal constraints around this debate. But thank you, all three of you, very much for sharing your views. Well, just as the country's balance sheet means that Labour Labour doesn't want to be as generous as many of its MPs and maybe voters might like with cash republic spending. The Conservatives can't be certain about those tax cuts that they might love to promise and have been dangling to their backbenchers and voters for some time. Yesterday, in fact, the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, more or less said, well, you can forget it, at least in the medium term. One of his team is Victoria Atkins, and she's with us this morning for the first time. Welcome to you, Minister. Um, first of all, the story dominating today is the BBC. Um, Briefly, what do you think the BBC should do? Well, look, these are very, very serious allegations and the BBC uh, needs to act swiftly. It needs to follow its procedures that it says it has in place. But I, I'm a former Minister for Safeguarding and I worked for 20 years in the criminal justice system. And so in all of this and in our conversations about it, we have to remember that there is a person, a young person at the centre of this, who will be feeling all sorts of emotions and will be feeling all possibly very, very distressed. So we do need, please, to keep that person in our minds as we discuss this. And everyone should take care in these discussions, of course. Let's then talk about your job as Financial Secretary to the Treasury. Now, we know the government is committed to keeping a lid on pay. The government has said because of that, it should adhere to the recommendations of independent pay bodies whose job it is to set the pay. If they recommend increasing pay for public sector workers by 6%, as we expect, will workers get it? Well, the recommendations have been received and, of course, we're looking through them very carefully and we will announce our um, decision in due course. But this is against the backdrop, as you've already been talking about in today's programme, of the very, very strong inflationary currents we have around us. The number one enemy for us all is inflation. It is hurting all of us, but particularly the poorest in society. And that's why the Prime Minister has it as his number one priority to uh, tackle inflation, because that way we will all feel the 
benefit of our wage packets except, in the future. Except when you look at what the pay review bodies themselves say about inflation, they say public sector wages are so far behind the private sector, there is little risk of the government setting a precedent for more inflationary pay rises. So the pay review bodies themselves say that's not an argument here. So I'll ask you again, if the independent bodies set 6%, Will workers get 6%? Well, I haven't seen the reports. As I say, they're being considered at the moment. But on the wider issue of the jobs market, one of the reasons, one of the pressures that we have uh, causing this very sticky inflation is precisely because we have such high employment rates. Uh, you know, after 13 years of government, we are delighted that we have so many people in work, earning a salary uh, and all the benefits that being employed means. But what that does mean is that it has an impact on our inflation. And so this is why we are having to be so very careful to get a grip on inflation because that will help everyone across the country I mean, just both in the private and the public sector. The independent pay review bodies have said that actually inflation is not affected by public sector pay increases because pay is so far behind and there's a principle here I mean Rishi Sunak himself I think we can show viewers this quote says the government was reasonable and being fair accepted the recommendations in full Oliver Dowden, who is the Deputy Prime Minister, who says, we want to take the politics out of this. We have an independent process and we should adhere to that. And you yourself said in the Houses of Parliament, pay for most frontline workforces is set through an independent pay review body process. Now, listening to you this morning, it sounds like actually you're ready to junk that process. Not at all. What I'm saying is I, I'm not involved. I'm the minister responsible for tax. I'm not involved in considerations about the uh, pay review body but recommendations. But you're the financial secretary but, but to the Treasury. You must this. have a view on if whether or not this, it's worth ditching that principle because the economy is in such difficulty. That may be your view, but if that is your view, I think our viewers would like to hear so, it. So, uh, as I say, I'm not involved in uh, those discussions at the moment, and therefore it would be quite wrong for me, actually, to speculate as to what is uh, going on with those discussions. You're quite but happy I to would talk also, about it in the House of Commons not I, so long ago. But I would, just, I would just point out, we're in this situation that happens, I find myself on media rounds, where I'm quite rightly and understandably being asked questions about a process that is in the middle of being um, conducted and so in, in a few weeks time whenever the recommendations whenever the response is published you will then have your answer as to what the government's view is I but have I to focus as, as financial secretary on uh, taxes but also on the impact of inflation and so I'm just trying to set that overall context and understood but I suppose the question our viewers and public sector workers watching will want to know do you as a Treasury Minister believe that things are so tough in terms of the public finances that it might be worth ditching that principle of following the independent pay review bodies? Uh, as That's I a question on principle. Uh, That's not me asking you to divulge all sorts of secret mm -hmm. things. So we, we really value the fact, you know, we value the bodies, we have got their report, we are looking into it and, and the results will be announced soon. But do you have a view on whether it's time to ditch That's that principle? Maybe, because, maybe it's completely unaffordable and, and, and you could say that to our viewers and people might either understand or get but angry. But I, I can't really spec I can't comment on something I do not know. And I, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying this because I'm trying to be awkward or avoid a question. I am not involved, quite rightly, I'm not involved in that process because my responsibilities are collection of tax. The, the, those others who are in government are looking at it incredibly carefully because we fully understand how important this is for people at home who are waiting the results of those um, uh, decisions. Decisions. Let's talk about tax then, which is your responsibility. Clearly, there's not much money to spend. We know that's the Treasury's thinking. Your boss, Jeremy Hunt, indicated very strongly that either voters or your colleagues on the Conservative backbench is hoping for tax cuts anytime soon should forget it. Yeah, and look, we, we are Conservatives. We absolutely fundamentally believe in lower taxes. I want people to be able to keep more of their hard-earned uh, earnings in their pockets and purses. But we are in a situation at the moment where, because we were able to support people so well during the pandemic, in thanks, I have to say, to the hard work of the uh, previous uh, 10 years of Conservative government, of which David was one, uh, because of the hard work that we had over that decade, we were able to support people through the pandemic. And you'll remember schemes 
such as furlough. We saved millions of jobs. But does that mean that people can forget about any tax cuts before the next election? So we have this money that we have rightly spent. And, and by the way, Labour wasn't arguing with us spending this money to support people and to support the NHS. We have also spent £94 billion on cost of living support, which is incredibly important. Has made so my question is, should people. people forget tax cuts before the next election? So we, uh, we, we want to be fiscally responsible. So both the Prime Minister and the Chancellor have said that as, as soon as we can, we will uh, cut taxes. But there, we do have to be fiscally responsible about this, which is why we've had to make some very difficult decisions. But I'm asking you about the, the timing of, of what that might mean, because your boss, Jeremy Hunt, seemed to indicate yesterday very clearly that essentially people could absolutely forget about the idea of any tax cuts in the autumn and the implication being you might not be able to promise them before the election. So our priority, as Jeremy set out yesterday, has to be tackling inflation. That is the quickest way that we can help people make their wage packets go further. And so this is why the Prime Minister, who was talking about this, by the way, two years before anyone else, um, that's why he's made his number one priority out of his five priorities. And you've made and that we're doing point, all sorts but I'm asking you a to, different um, question. Should people view, listening this morning your colleagues on the back benches, people in government, should they hear from you and from your boss, Jeremy Hunt, that actually, you know what, things are so tough in the economy that tax cuts are simply off the agenda for the foreseeable future. So as, as Jeremy the Chancellor said yesterday, um, we are having to you know, tackle inflation. That has to be our priority. We do not have the headroom at the moment to, uh, in the, you know, to, to look at tax cuts, but as soon as we can, as soon as we have taken the measures that we are taking to reduce inflation, then we will be able to start having those but conversations. But would you say there's any uh, chance of that happening well, this autumn so now? I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm minded of, reminded of the fact that in the autumn we introduced the energy price guarantee, which not only helped people immediately with their energy bills, it's also cut two percentage points off inflation. Uh, and when we talk about, as we have done, about the pressures on the jobs market because we have um, so many people in work, we unlocked through the spring budget all sorts of ways to help uh, get people back into the workforce, including the transformational childcare package. Uh, and, and we are also um, doing everything we can to keep people in the jobs uh, sector, which is why we made those pension changes. So that we are doing very, very practical things to try to improve the situation. But the only way we will do this is by being fiscally responsible and certainly not by borrowing £28 billion pounds like Labour has suggested. OK. All right. Victoria Atkins, great to have you in the studio with us for the Thank first you. time. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much, Steve, for coming in. Well, you might think that's more than enough politics for one morning. Not if you're me, of course, but you can always go to iPlayer for more. But for something completely different, you might have the book A Little Life on your shelf. It's one of the most controversial bestsellers of recent years. Or maybe there's a higher chance that you've watched the actors James Norton in Happy Valley or Luke Thompson in Bridgerton. But right now you can see them together on stage in a theatre version of that book, A Little Life. It has a hardcore subject matter, abuse, recovery and redemption. And the performance has had some pretty intense reactions too. Audience members have passed out and the star's nudity has gone viral after a spectator took a secret photo during the play and posted it online. Well, yesterday I talked to both of the actors and James Norton opened up about his relationship with the troubled main character he plays, called Jude. He is a man um, who in his early years experiences extreme uh, trauma and abuse and then starts a journey of rehabilitation and, and healing. And very quickly he meets these young men um, who become his sort of very close friends and, and not to give anything away, but Willem um, and Jude have a very particular relationship which grows into something much deeper. And these people come around and they sort of love him out of his pain. And mm -hmm. so it really is a story about healing and a redemptive love. Um, and, and, the and the struggle of that, you know, how, I think a lot of made is that of how extreme the suffering is. But actually, it is a relate. I think that sounds mad to say, but it is a relatable story because I think it's about how hard it is, how, how suffering can define us and how hard it is to let go of one's suffering and then actually you know we hold our suffering close and, know, I think and it's quite hard to like let go of it but for people watching it here in the theater and and soon on cinema screens around the country people are going to be able to see it it is also you know a real kind of spectacle of you know self-harm shouting mm. weeping three hours of it mm. uh, what's it like for you to do that every night uh it's it's been the hardest 
thing I've ever done, career or otherwise, but it's also been the most rewarding. Uh, it, I, I will look back on this moment in my life and um, I think I, it will have been a really important moment for me personally, for my career. I was, I was terrified of this, I was, and I still am most nights. I still get you know, a bout of nerves before I go on. Um, but that's the only testament to how much I care and it's really wonderful to care this much about a job. One of the things that also happens in this play, which people are now very comfortable talking about, is male nudity. Do you feel that you've been objectified in a way that female actors actually wouldn't be now? Obviously there was one unfortunate moment um, when we, I was objectified and the, the photos were taken and it was put in the tabloid press. What was incredibly um, encouraging and, and sort of um, heartwarming about that experience was the way the community, the theatre, community and also just the wider community like society in general I mean it wasn't like that big a story but people who were aware of it really came together and said this is just not appropriate at all there was very little um, it felt like from my point of view there was very little um, sort of salivating around that story if anything it was um, outrage and that was really uh, a really encouraging reaction to what was a moment of objectification do you feel that as a young actor, you know, most people watching this will know you from Bridgerton and you sort of arrived on our screens and people thought, oh, goodness me, and you've got legions of fans, not least to share information and pictures and things about you on their phones. Mm. I mean, do you feel that is a particular pressure as an actor of your generation? Um, maybe. I mean, personally, not for me because I'm not on social media, so I don't really care. As in, like, I, 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 and I, I don't even, it doesn't disturb me. Like, I sort of think... The whole idea of, of being an actor is that you do want to live in people's imaginations in some kind of way. So I encourage it, I just don't want, any, I don't want to have any part of it. Like people are welcome to do whatever they like. I don't really care. Do you use social media? Do you think it's something that you are, you, are you happy with the role it now has in the sort of, I suppose the world of celebrity really? I use it um, f to promote work, which I'm proud of. And I'm really happy, for example, to be able to promote this. And, and when we film this show, I'll be able to reach the the, the followers I have and hopefully encourage them to watch this and I'm so proud of it and social media will be a way of, of reaching more and more people so there are very there are positives in, I'm a diabetic I found incredible um, uh, communi uh, relationships through social media th with other diabetics I have m masses of parents of diabetics or diabetics themselves reaching out on Instagram just saying it's great to see you doing what you're doing is that a particular challenge when it comes to how physical being on stage for so long is it is. I mean, it's it's challenging um, in a play environment anyway because um, well, adrenaline affects sugar levels. The very fact that I'm not allowed, I can't leave the stage for apart from the interval for the three and a half hours. I don't leave the stage, and so I have to find um, kind of ingenious ways of of working out what my sugar levels are doing and then mitigating against going hypoglycemic, which is the risky uh, low, and that will then cause me to. Um, become disorientated and sweat and eventually, you know, faint. So I have to mitigate against that and I have these glucose shots spread around the stage. There are bits of food which I have to eat and I have to eat more of it when I need the sugar and less when I don't. Um, but so far it's been really encouraging and, and, I, and I, if you'd asked me six months ago whether I would have been able to do a four hour, three and a half hour play non-stop as a diabetic, I would have been really scared. And I've, I'm so proud that I've proved to myself and to other type 1 diabetics that I'm able to do that. I'm sure that'll mean a lot of people, to a lot to a lot of people hearing you, hearing you say that. And I know we have to finish now, but I want to just ask you both, when you get to the end of this run, I think there's another four weeks, what will you remember from this extraordinary production? Might there be a little bit of relief? So there will be a bit of relief. Um, I was saying to you yesterday, I think I'll, I'll miss sharing a stage with him. I, yeah, so, so <laughs> it's really, we have something very special up there. Yeah. It's really, it's very unique. And, and I think, yeah, we, th something magic happens every night. I've never been in part of a play or a production film or theater where every single night, some moment of alchemy happens and um, we experience it together and the rest of the company experience it and the audience experience it. And, you know, without being conceited at all, it, the fact that every single person in this auditorium stands at the end in the mm -hmm. curtain call and cheers, I've never experienced anything like it. Every single night, you see people just covered in tears. Mm -hmm. I will miss that, I will miss that, but I will also look forward to a little bit of a holiday because it's been tough. Well, maybe you can work together again on something yeah, else. Maybe James nice. Bond yeah. and Q. Which is <laughs> <laughs> You can have him, it's oh, not yeah, my yeah. back. <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking to us today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks Thank very you. much. 
He was a bit coy about that, wasn't he? And that stage version of A Little Life will be in a cinema near you across the UK from the 28th of September. Now, cast your minds back to the beginning of the programme and making ends meet as a country is top of the list right now. And Rachel Reeves, who wants to be the next Chancellor, told me that keeping a tight lid on the finances would be her priority. All of our plans will be built on a rock of economic and fiscal responsibility. Labour will not play fast and loose with the public finances because the people who pay the price for that are people who are own their own homes, who wish to own their own homes, people running small businesses. We've had tons of emails from you this morning. Short shrift, I have to say, for both parties. Brian Wells said, I used to be a Labour supporter until the infamous 2010 note left by Liam Byrne. How can a responsible government leave the economy in such an awful state? It was unforgivable. Labour, no way. Todd O'Brien, on the other hand, said, My food bill has doubled and is increasing. There are no houses to buy or rent at reasonable rates for my children. The NHS has been driven into the ground. The Tories have done this. Thank you so much for getting in touch. We love hearing from you. Let's hear finally from our panel, from their closing verdict. Uh, now, David, you used to have the job as Financial Secretary to the Treasury, as we were speaking to Victoria Atkins, who holds that conch right now. How did you think she did? I mean, is she in an impossible position or should she be able to say what they're going to do? Well, I had a sense of nostalgia, I have to say, of being a sort of Treasury Minister when the public finances are in a difficult situation and there's no real good news to, to announce. I, I think the government is in a difficult position on uh, public sector pay, having stakes a very clear position about backing public uh, the, the pay review bodies. Yeah, backing and the independent. Backing the independents and then, and then clearly questioning whether they're going to follow through with that. I, I can understand where the government is coming from in terms of the concern about inflation, particularly about the extra, where's this going to be, how's this going to be paid for? If you're going to be borrowing more, mm. then you know, it's a big spending commitment and that's going to make the fight against inflation harder. But we're, we're at the moment placing so much weight on public sector pay and if you want to have good public services, you do need to recruit, retain and motivate public sector staff. And, and we, public sector pay is increasingly uncompetitive. And we know that those vacancies are such a huge part of what's driving the strikes across the sectors. I mean, Alison, do you think that people will have heard Victoria Atkins and, and, and thought, what? what do you think people's response will be? Yeah, I think it's pretty outrageous. I mean, that outrageous? Whole thing, well, the, the whole thing that she won't commit one way or the other is, is just more sort of waffle that people are just sick of but also we're talking about the people that have got us through the last few years of this pandemic and after months of saying no it's the independent pay review we can only follow the independent pay review mm. oh the independent pay review is saying mm. something we don't want to hear so we're not going to follow the independent pay review mm. it just stinks and it and it again speaks to that kind of breakdown of trust finally james norton was quite coy there when i tried to tease him and have a bit of a gag about whether or not he might be the next bond Stuart, who would your dream bond be dream bond well, uh, he, presumably, so he needs to be macho, needs to get into trouble occasionally. Oh. Uh, but also get the nation out of trouble, so Ben Stokes. Oh, Ben Stokes, <laughs> there we go. Alison, quickly, your dream well, bond. I wondered whether um, Boris Johnson's out of job, he keeps running. Is he trying to get in shape for it, perhaps? Goodness me, and there's our thoughts. The <laughs> <laughs> David, a dream well, bond I, I, for I, I, you? Do you back the... Boris's bond? No. There's uh, a uh, slogan. Enough, <laughs> yes, that would, that would be a surprise for so <laughs> many be against your brand. So ways. <laughs> yes, quite. And uh, I think Ben Stokes needs to keep on the cricket. Actually. There we go. So. There we go. Well, we got... An interesting idea of you, Stuart. Thank you all very much for all of your ideas and insights in the last 60 minutes. Thank you to you for sharing your stories and, of course, for watching and being with us this morning when we have tried to sketch out a bit more of the real difference between Labour and the Conservatives on the economy. They do share an ethos right now that it's not the moment to be offering huge tax cuts or huge big checks for ordinary public spending, whatever economists on the outsides might say. But we do know that the main party's instincts and ambitions are different, but they have different tasks as well. The opposition perhaps has to persuade you what it would mean in practice to translate a hefty poll lead into practical promises. The job for the Conservatives, in contrast, is to try to grab back their traditional lead on being able to run the economy. Years in power and months of chaos this year have squandered. That is quite the to-do list for both of them. As ever, thank you so much for your company. You can check in always on the BBC website or go to iPlayer if you missed anything or I'll just look forward to seeing you here, same time, same place, next week. Goodbye.